السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome everyone Today we will talk about the spinal cord anatomy and function So the spinal cord is a part from the central nervous system and its function is to connect the brain to the different parts of the body and to carry signals and orders between them It also can act independently of the brain in conducting some reflexes as we will see later on It lies inside the vertebral canal and extends as a continuation from the brain stem through the foramen magnum at the base of the skull and it ends at the level between the first and second vertebrae. The end of the spinal cord is called the conus medullaris and its tapering end continues at the thin thread called the phylum terminal all the way down to the first coccygeal vertebrae and it anchors the spinal cord in place. This disproportion between the length of the spinal cord and the vertebral column is because the spinal cord finishes growing around the age of 4 while the vertebral column continues till the age of 14 to 18 so the vertebral column is longer than the spinal cord. Like the vertebral column, the spinal cord is divided into 5 segments cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral and coccygeal and each segment provides several pairs of spinal nerves which are 8 pairs of cervical nerves, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral and 1 pair of coccygeal nerves. The spinal cord and the spinal nerve roots are wrapped within three layers called the meninges. The outermost and the toughest is the dura mater, underneath is the arachnoid and the deepest one is the pia mater. The dura has two layers, periosteal and meningeal, between which is the epidural space, and between the arachnoid, the arachnoid and the pia mater is the subarachnoid space containing the cerebrospinal fluid. Spinal cord has two main sources of blood supply, the vertebral artery, which gives the anterior spinal artery and two posterior spinal arteries, which run along the length of the spinal cord. The second source is the segmental arteries which arise from the aorta and it enters the spinal cord through the intervertebral foramina according to their level. They reinforce the anterior and posterior spinal arteries and divides into terminal branches called the radicular arteries which supplies the nerve roots. The spinal cord is made of gray and white matter just like other parts of the central nervous system and its cut section shows four surfaces anterior, posterior and two lateral surfaces and it has anterior fissure and three sulci anterolateral, posterolateral and posterior sulcus the grey matter is butterfly in shape and it, and it occupies the central part of the spinal cord it is comprised of neural cell bodies and it has anterior, lateral and posterior holes the white matter on the other hand surrounds the grey matter and it, made, and it is made of axons which contains the neural pathways that connect the brain with the rest of the body through the spinal nerves. Each spinal nerve has anterior or ventral root transmitting motor information which originates from anterior horn cells of the grey matter and exit spinal cord through the anterolateral sulcus and the posterior or dorsal root transmitting sensory information and it originates from the posterior horn cells each dorsal root has a sensory ganglia and it exits the spinal cord through the posterior posterolateral sulcus the anterior and the posterior roots merge just before the intervertebral foramina and form the trunk of the spinal nerve which divides shortly after exiting the foramina into anterior ramus, posterior ramus, communicating and meningeal rami. Each segment of the spinal cord gives two pairs of spinal nerves, which exits from the intervertebral foramina of the corresponding vertebral level. But because the vertebral column grows longer than the spinal cord, each spinal cord segment is higher than the corresponding vertebra and this difference become more obvious distally towards lumbar and sacral segments for example the lumbar spinal cord segment number five is at the level of the first lumbar vertebra 
So, in order for more distal spinal nerves to exit through their corresponding vertebral foramina, they must first travel through the vertebral canal, and since lumbar and sacral spinal nerves are farthest from their intervertebral foramina, they are the longest, and while descending, they form a bundle called the coda equina. Formation and signals carried by the spinal nerves travel through the spinal cord through neural pathways called the spinal cord tracts. These tracts are found in the, within the, sp the white matter of the spinal cord. The white matter is divided into three funiculi, anterior, lateral, and posterior funiculus. They are either ascending tracts which deliver information from the periphery to the brain or descending tracts which deliver the information from the brain to the peripheral body. Some of the most important ascending tracts are the dorsal column, the lateral spinothalamic tract, the ventral spinothalamic tract, and some of the most important descending tracts are the lateral corticospinal and the ventral corticospinal tract. Posterior or dorsal column is responsible for vibration, proprioception, and fine touch. It has two nuclei, gracile nucleus, which carries information from the lower limbs, and the cuneate nucleus, which carries information from the upper limbs. Then the signals ascend in the ipsilateral side in the dorsal column until the level of the medulla where it crosses to the opposite side, then it continues its way to the brain. The lateral spinothalamic tract is responsible for pain and temperature. The signals enter the spinal cord through the posterior horn cells, then it crosses to the opposite side at the same level and ascend in the contralateral spinothalamic tract till its way to the brain. The anterior spinothalamic tract is also one of the ascending tracts. It is responsible for the crude touch. The signal enters the spinal cord through the posterior horn cells and it also crosses to the opposite side and ascends in the contralateral ventral spinothalamic tract till its way to the brain. The corticospinal tract is one of the descending tracts. It is responsible for voluntary motor control. There is lateral and ventral corticospinal tracts. The fibers that represent the upper limbs lies more medial in the lateral spinothalamic tract and the lower limbs lies more lateral. The signal starts in the brain and descend at the level of the medulla. It crosses to the opposite side and continue as a lower motor neuron until it exits the spinal cord through the anterior horn cell of the corresponding level. Although a huge part of the spinal cord function is under the influence of the brain, there are many reflexes that are generated in the spinal cord independently of the brain. The reflex is a rapid automatic response to a particular stimulus, and its pathway lies entirely within the spinal cord. Spinal cord reflexes are either monosynaptic with only two neurons participating in reflex arc, one motor and one sensory, or polysynaptic that have multiple neurons participating and they are more complex and involve different groups of muscles. An example of a monosynaptic reflex is a stretch reflex. The stimulus is a sudden stretch of a tendon which triggers a stretch receptor in the muscles sending signals through the afferent or sensory neuron to the dorsal root ganglion, the posterior horn cells, then the anterior horn cells send signals through the efferent neuron to the muscle, stretched muscle, which lead to its contraction. Some of the most important examined monosynaptic reflexes are biceps, triceps, brachioradialis, and the quadriceps femoris reflexes. Regarding the polysynaptic reflexes, some of the most important examined reflexes 
are the, the upper and lower abdominal reflexes which is can be tested by lightly stroking the abdominal wall diagonally towards the umbilicus which leads to contraction of the abdominal wall and the umbilicus twitches toward the stimulus. Also the cremasteric reflex which is can be tested by stroking the inner aspect of the skin of the thigh which leads to pull up of the epilateral testicles due to contraction of the cremasteric muscle. The blunter reflex also is one of the polysynaptic reflexes. It can be tested by application of a sharp instrument on the lateral aspect of the sole of the foot which leads to blunter flexion of the big toe. The inner reflex is tested by stroking the skin around the anus uh, which leads to contraction of the external anal sphincter. Also one of the most important reflex reflexes are the bulbocavernosus reflex which is important in diagnosis of the spinal shock. The bulbocavernosus reflex can be tested by compressing the glands penis in males or applying pressure on the clitoris in females and the observation of the con of the contraction of the anal sphincter. It's also the first reflex that returns after the end of spinal shock. Thank you.